Oh, I had an embarrassing moment just a few uh, minutes ago. I was in the speaker's lounge, and I'm working on fitness, and I'm trying to solve a really nasty concurrency bug. And uh, somebody walks in the room, and they look at my screen, and they say, you're at a break point. I was. I did. I had the debugger off. You know, I, and the guy looked at me, oh, yeah. What can I say? I did have the debugger up. Who knows what that is? What is that picture up there? Not the book. Yeah, the, uh, the astronomical photograph. That is a picture of the Sombrero Galaxy, uh, which is, I don't know, a few hundred, a few... Um, uh, uh, how far? A few million light years away. I'm not exactly sure how far away it is, 130 million light years or something like that. The Most of the pictures that we see of this don't show it quite as clearly as this. This red bit here came from a new telescope, the Spitzer telescope, which, which shows us infrared radiation. And the infrared can penetrate the dust. You can see all this dust and, and stuff here. We, did, we didn't used to be able to see all this ring material behind the dust, but now we can see that it is a ring. And look at how nice that ring is. It's perfect. Now, this ring is perhaps 100,000 light years in diameter. And something cleared out this area in there, which is maybe 80,000 light years in diameter. What the heck could clear out an area 80,000 light years in diameter? Something fairly violent. Uh, we know that there's a black hole right here, or at least we believe there is one. Uh, and probably what happened sometime in the not too uh, distant past is that that black hole swallowed a few rather large stars. And when a black hole swallows matter, it emits about half the energy half the mass of that matter as energy. You can do the general relativity equation, E equals mc squared. That's actually a special relativity equation. Uh, e equals mc squared to figure out just how much energy that would be. But imagine several dozen solar masses getting turned into energy in the matter of a month or so, and you can envision a very, very large uh, outpouring of energy. Uh, perhaps that is what cleared this really large hole in the middle of a galaxy. We wouldn't be too pleased if our own galaxy did this. Uh, and of course, there'd be no way to know until it, the wave front hit us. Uh, but we do know that our own galaxy does not have a massive bla uh, uh, black hole of that kind. Uh, it does have a good sized black hole. Our own galaxy has a black hole of about 10 million solar masses. But this one is several billion solar masses. It's it's going to be swallowing larger things. The other thing about our own galaxy is that although there are stars orbiting our central black hole, none of them are in any great risk of diving in at the moment. So we probably won't have an event like this for a while in our galaxy, which I suppose we should be thankful for. Uh, but that's not what I want to talk about. Well, actually, it is what I want to talk about, but I have to talk about some other things. The name of this talk is Clean Code, and what I'm going to be focusing on in particular are functions. Uh, the code you are going to see is going to be Java code, and you poor C-sharp programmers, I know you won't be able to read any of it because it's so incredibly different from C-sharp. The two languages are not even close to being the same, but I'm sure that uh, we'll muddle by somehow. I have a long function that I want to show you. This is a function that I took out of fitness oh, several years ago. And I saw it in fitness at the time. It was fairly long. I thought, oh, that's ugly. I need to refactor it. So I split it up into uh, many short functions. I'm going to show you what it looked like before I split it up. And then I will show you what it looked like after I split it. Uh, here it is. It's going to take three screenfuls to show it to you. I'm going to give you one minute per screenfull. What I want you to do is read this code carefully, 
And then at the end, after three minutes, one minute per screenful, at the end, I will ask you what this code does. And we will start now. So, what does this code do? Okay, now you, you did very well there. You picked out a number of interesting keywords. It crawls through the wiki page hierarchy and it, it looks for uh, things that it can inherit down into that hierarchy. It p crawls through the test suites uh, looking for things that it can inherit into that hierarchy. What kind of things does it inherit into the hierarchy? Hash include. Well, bang include. What else? You may have noticed the word setup in there. Uh, it's trying to pull in the setup pages. Now, you, you may not know what fitness is. I don't care if you know what fitness is or not, but you, you should have been able to look at that code and go, well, it looks like it's trying to do something with setups and teardowns, and, it, and it's, uh, at the end, it's converting something to HTML. But this code is hard to decipher. It's full of problems. Let's look back at it a little bit and see if we can see what we don't like about it. The first thing I don't like about it is simply its length. This function is too long. How long is it? Oh, maybe 60 lines. And we'll come a little bit later to how long a function ought to be, but this one is too long. It's 60 lines long. It also has a number of other problems. Uh, this kind of thing right here, look at that. That violates a principle. Does anybody know what the name of that principle is? It's called the law of Demeter. And the law of Demeter uh, says you probably shouldn't have um, functions or expressions that have lots of dots in them. Right? Where you get suite setup dot get page caller dot get full path. Uh, there are some other ones like that where you get lots of dots. We sometimes call expressions like this train wrecks. We call them train wrecks because they look like uh, train cars coupled together. And they are wrecks. Uh, 
There's a number of other problems here. Notice that the level of abstraction goes in and out and in and out. At some times we seem to be talking about very high level concepts like sweet responders and page crawlers. And at other time we're talking about extremely low level concepts like string buffers. And there's all these mystical strings in here. We don't know what they mean. So we're moving in and out of levels of abstraction confusing the poor reader because the reader has no idea what's important and what's not. The, the reader simply has to go with the flow and try and understand what's going on here. Now, if you understood this or not, it doesn't matter. There's not actually very much going on in there. Uh, it's, in fact, it's a fairly simple, simple function, which I'll explain to you in a little bit later. But there's a lot of gunk happening, a lot of, lot of uh, detail, too many different levels of abstraction, strange strings, odd function calls, doubly nested if statements, controlled by flags. So I have a word to describe this, ick. This is an icky function. Icky is a technical term. Right? Now, what I'm going to do is show you my first refactoring, which, by the way, I refactored it since then, and you'll see the second refactoring as well. But the first refactoring is what I did uh, first when I passed through this. I'm going to do a little bit of extracting of methods, a little bit of renaming uh, to try and capture the intent of the function. I believe I can put it on the screen in a single screen full. There it is. And I'll give you a minute. This function, it should be much clearer now what it's doing. Uh, it, it seems pretty clear that it's determining whether or not the page that it has is a test page. You can see that with this. By the way, this is called an explanatory variable. Uh, instead of leaving this expression out in the open, I put it into a variable that explains what it did, if it is a test page. Then I use that, if is test page, to do all of this. Notice that none of this gets done if this is not a test page. If it's not a test page, I simply return its HTML. But if it is a test page, then I go ahead and I get the page. I get a string buffer. I include the setup pages. I append the content. I include the teardown pages, put it back in the page, and then get its HTML. Right? And that should be a fairly clear. I'm building up the thing that needs to be tested by including the setups above it and the teardowns below it. Now, even if you don't know what fitness is, the concept of a setup and a teardown in a test ought to make sense to you. So this is a much clearer function. We're going to do better than this in a few minutes, but you still probably don't understand it all, but you ought to kind of get the gist of it. Uh, the function is telling you more about what it does. It includes setups and teardowns and renders them in HTML. You also probably realize that this belongs to some kind of web-based testing framework. You knew that because it had a get HTML in it, so it must be web-based. It's a testing framework because it's got setups and teardowns in it. Uh, you can divine that information from the refactored function pretty easily, but the original one, it would have been hard even to make that determination about. Uh, the initial function was pretty well obscured. What was the magic here? How did, how did I make that function explain itself better? How did I turn it from a bunch of raggedy left edge code to something that states its intent well? And can we duplicate that 
in all of our code? Can we make all of our code such that you can look at a function and read it without deep confusion? The first rule of doing that is to keep things small. How small should a function be? The first rule of functions is that they should be small. The second rule is they should be smaller than that. I'm emphasizing the word small here for a reason. How big should a function be? One. One what? One line of code. Now that's a good function. A function that's one line of code you will understand. Now there might be a lot of those functions in your code. Uh, so, but you will understand the one line function. Now, do we want to get it a little bigger than that? Ten. Ten lines. Uh, okay, ten lines. That sounds fine. Somebody over here said a page full. Uh, that was a, a rule that was concocted back when uh, the page was a VT100 screen, which had 24 lines, four of which were used by the editor. So the rule back in the 70s was, well, maybe 20 lines. Uh, I think even 20 lines is too large. I like my functions to be much smaller than that if possible. Four or five lines is a good a good limit for me. I will make them longer. If you go through my code, you'll see that some of my functions are 10 lines long, and uh, a few of them are even more than that. But if you did an average over the, over the whole code base, you'd find that they were all very, very small, four, five, six lines or something like that. Very small. Uh, and you might think, well, wait a minute. If, you, if I make all of my functions that small, uh, there won't be any thread of control. No one will be able to start at the top and read through and understand what's going on. Good. I don't want them to have to go to the right and to the left and to the right and to the left and try and figure out everything that's going on in one shot. I want each function to state what it does in a few lines so that you can look at the function and say, oh, yep, 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 I see what this does. If it's a test page, it includes the setups, it includes the page, it includes the teardowns, it converts it to HTML, done. I don't want you to have to know what it means to go and include all the, all the setups or how we do it or what the magical strings are all about. I want those statements in clear text easily in front of you. I want your functions small. How small is small? Well, we, we want to crank these things down to like four lines or five lines. So I've refactored that function yet again down to this. Notice what this one does. If it's a test page, include the setup and teardowns, and then convert it to HTML. It's kind of hard to get clearer than that. Right? Look at that function. You know exactly what it does. If it's a test page, we're going to include the setups and teardowns. Then we're going to convert it to HTML. OK, that problem solved. Now, how the heck do you include the setups and teardowns? And if you were to look inside this function, you would find that it was a function that said, well, I'm going to include the setups. And uh, if it's a setup page and, and uh, if it's a suite, I'll also include the suite setups. And then that'll return. And then it will include the, uh, the content. And then it will include the teardowns. So there's a fair bit of logic there, but each one of those will be stated in four or five lines of code, and then they will call yet other functions that are four or five lines of code in a very nice downward descent. Uh, it's pretty easy to read this one. And once you've read it, you know exactly what that whole function is trying to do. And then you can get in the details of how it does it by reading the ones uh, a few lines down. If our functions are that small, if they're four or five or six lines, then if there is an if statement, how big is the if statement? How many lines are in the body of the if statement? One. And what should that be? A function call. So what it does. If I've got an if statement, I want the body of the if statement to be a function call. If I've got a while loop, I want the body of the while loop to be a function call. And what about the predicate of the if statement? The stuff inside the parentheses of the if statement. I want that to be a function call. I want that to state what it's testing. If you've got a while loop, I want the thing inside the parentheses to be a function call. Some of you might be embedded programmers and you're thinking, wait a minute, this is a lot of function calls. They're, they take time. Yeah, they do take time. They take at least a nanosecond. 
Now, maybe there's a place in your code somewhere at some extremely low level position in the deep down loops of it where you're worried about a nanosecond. Most of the time, you're not worried about nanoseconds. So I would just break out those functions uh, as quickly as possible. Also, you've got to give some credit to your compiler. The compilers are actually very good at noticing the fact that this function is the only one that calls that function, so it inlines it and doesn't actually do the function call. So give some credit to the optimizers where you can. I want small, small, small. If you've got four or five lines in your function, how much indenting can you do? How many levels of indent do you think you can have? One. That's about it. Maybe you could squeeze two in there. It'd be tough. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I don't want your code to look like the edge of a saw. I want it to look nice in line with maybe a bump every once in a while. Oh yeah, there's an if statement there. I don't want to see a lot. How many of you have dealt with functions that are thousands of lines long and you find your way around in that function by counting the number of indent levels? Oh yeah, it's at the third indent level down. I remember that. It's the third if statement, the big if statement, the third one down, okay. And then if you go about halfway in, there's that statement. We, we begin to recognize our code geographically by landmark instead of by name. And we could do it by name. If every block, if every indent were given a name by pulling it out into a function, we would be able to recognize our code by name instead of by geography. There's an old maxim in software that says your, your code should do one thing. It should do a one thing well and one thing only. Your functions should do one thing. What does that mean? It's always been confusing to me to know what one thing means, but I think I have a definition for you. And, and as we get into this talk, I'll try and convince you that that definition is what I mean. Uh, it used to be that we had this rule of uh, what was it? It was the rule of cohesion. And you can read this in Tom DeMarco's works and Myler Page Jones's works. Uh, a function should do it, do one thing, it should do it well, it should do it only. But what does that one thing mean? The original code that I showed you did a lot more than one thing. It was really easy to tell that it did a lot more than one thing because it created string buffers, it fetched pages, it searched for inherited pages, it rendered paths, it appended strange strings, it generated HTML, it did all these things. So it's very easy to see that that big function I showed you at the beginning was doing more than one thing. But did that final function I show you, did that do one thing? Huh? Let's take a look. The final one which had only a few lines in it, you could make the case that it was doing three things. If we take a look at that code, we we'll go back to it. There it is. You could make the case that this is doing three things. It's determining whether or not we have a test page, then it's including the setup and teardowns, and then it's converting them to HTML. So you could, you could make the case that this was three things, but I don't believe it is. I believe this is one thing, and here's why. The steps in that function are all at the same level of abstraction. They all have to do with the same, uh, same concept, which was I've got a test page, I've got a page, and I need to turn it into a testable page. So I do what's necessary to turn it into a testable page. I can uh, represent it in a paragraph that looks like this. I call this a to paragraph because it uses the word to in front of it. To render a page with setups and teardowns, we check to see if the page is a test page. If so, include the setups and teardowns. In either case, render the page in HTML. There's no descending layers of detail here. I'm never going down into the levels of string buffers. There are no arcane strings. There's no statement about crawling pages. I haven't left the realm of the page and why we're here. So this is one thing. Another way to say that it's one thing is that there's no way to reduce it. 
There's no extractions I could do on this code. There's no way to make it smaller without just duplicating code. If I took, for example, this if statement out and extracted it as a function, the name of the function would be include setups and teardowns if test page. Doesn't add anything. So I think this is probably one thing. We have descended to a single layer level of abstraction. If we turn that on its head, we have a function, and that function seems to deal with high-level concepts, but it also deals with low-level concepts. Clearly, that's doing more than one thing. We want to pull out the low-level concepts. You have a function that does some high-level stuff and then creates a string buffer. That string buffer doesn't belong in there. You've got a function that does some high-level stuff, and then it, then it appends some strange string into something that doesn't belong in there. It's a change in the level of abstraction. We want our code, let's see if I've got to the right place, yep. You can tell if a function is doing more than one thing if you can extract a function, another function from it. If you can no longer extract functions from it, it's doing one thing. Which tells us that what we should do with all of our functions is continue to extract smaller functions from them until we can't anymore. Pull them apart into their atoms so that we can't pull them apart any longer. And then we will have created a whole bunch of functions that do one thing. If we do that, we're going to wind up with a lot of functions. And most of those functions will be called from one and only one place, it, it, violating the whole idea of what a function is. Usually, we think of functions as things that can be called from many places. The whole notion of a subroutine early on was that it could be called from several places. And yet what I am advocating is something very different. I'm saying, nope, we're going to create functions for no reason other than to give a batch of code a name and to use that name in the calls. So most of these functions we create will be called from only one place. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. And then I want you to order them. I want you to put the high-level functions on top. And they will call lower-level functions, which will call yet lower-level functions, which will call yet lower-level functions. I want you to organize your, your classes and your code the way journalists organize an article in a newspaper. The way they do that is they put the, the headline on top, then a synopsis paragraph, and then every paragraph thereafter gets more and more detailed as you go downward. The rule of thumb when reading a newspaper article is start at the top, read down, and stop when you get bored because you don't need to know any more detail below you. That's how I want you to read code. I want you to be able to read code by starting at the top, seeing the class name, seeing the variables, seeing the, the top level functions, and then read down until you get bored. And you know the functions below that don't mean anything anymore. You don't have to understand them any longer. I want you to read your programs as if they were a bunch of two paragraphs, each of which describes the current level of abstraction and references lower level two paragraphs one level down from that. So for example, the whole uh, function that we've been discussing, two, include the setups and teardowns, we include the setups, then include the test page, then include the teardowns. Two, include the setups, we include the suite setup, if this is a suite, then include the regular setup. To include the suite setup, we search the parent hierarchy for the suite setup page, add a bang include with the path of that page. You can see how this is going. Each level down gets more and more detailed. Each level down adds another level of detail, subtracting off the higher level stuff. You can read down until you finally get to something like that and think, okay, I don't need to know that. Go on to the next topic. That's how you do one thing. Extract, 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 extract until you can't extract anymore. How many of you are using Visual Studio? Sorry about that. Uh, how many of you are using a refactoring plugin like ReSharper? Almost all of you. Well, that's very good. Very good. Uh, and I don't know why Visual Studio doesn't have these things. It's been, you know, they've been around now for eight years or so. 
Uh, but ReSharper is a, a profoundly good tool. Sometimes when some of the, of the releases crash a bit. But I think the current one is fairly stable. Uh, it's a profoundly good tool, not just because of the way it colorizes your code, but because of the way you can use that refactoring tool to extract methods. Who's done a an extract method? Oh, good. You all know how to do this. Well, do it a lot. Do it a lot. Extract methods like crazy. Take all of your functions and shrink them down into tiny little three and four and five line functions using the extract method tool. The, uh, the refactoring tools are immensely profound. Uh, you, should, you should learn that menu by heart. You should learn all the hotkeys. If they don't have hotkeys, you should add them so that you can get to those refactorings and hit them like lightning. I want you to manipulate your code like a sculptor and manipulating clay. I want you to have all of the options for renaming and extracting and pushing up and pushing down and, and pulling things apart at your disposal, at your fingertips. I don't want you doing that in the editor. I don't want you copying and pasting code to move it around. Use those refactoring tools, memorize them, practice them, get some kata so that you can go around and, and internalize them so that you know exactly how to use them just like that. Use descriptive names. Okay, every single software guy in the world has told us use descriptive names, but I'm going to repeat it. Because as I go through the code in our industry, and I see an awful lot of it, I also see a lot of really terrible names. And that's a shame nowadays, because our refactoring tools will allow us to change names on a whim. You can, nowadays, you can point at a name and go, oh, I think I'll change it to that. Wham. Eh, I don't like that. I think I'll change it to this. <coughs> ah, no, I don't like that. Ah, I think I'll change it to that. You can do that five, six, seven times. Finally get a name that you like. And yes, there's a certain amount of impact in that because you're going to be changing many source files. But that's not nearly the problem that it used to be. Uh, there are issues with that. You, we're going to need to talk about some coupling and some design principles a little bit later to minimize the impact of it. But still... Changing names and using good names is immensely powerful. For example, I changed the name of that original function from that. What the heck was this name? Testable HTML. What did that tell anybody? Now that you see it, you can understand it. Right? It turned the page into testable HTML. But someone who was trying to understand that function wouldn't look at that and go, oh, I see, it's making the HTML testable. It wouldn't be able to follow that. I changed it to render page with setups and teardowns, which at least tells the reader what the heck the function is trying to do. That seems to me to be a better name. I also gave all of the private methods descriptive names too. You know, include setups and teardowns, include suite setup, include suite teardown. Those were all names that were highly descriptive. It is hard to overestimate the value of good names. How many of you have seen a class whose name made sense once, but doesn't make any sense anymore? It hasn't been changed, right? Now it's some name that, well, we just don't know why it has that name. Or a variable, a variable whose name maybe made sense once, but doesn't anymore. That name should be changed. And you should feel free to change those names. I just went through fitness of a little while ago and just changed a whole bunch of names in an interface because they were just the wrong names. And yeah, I'm going to catch some flack from some of the other guys maintaining it because they're going to look at it and go, oh, you changed the names. I don't understand them. Yeah, but they're a lot more descriptive. So you know, you're going to have to go through the pain of that, but it's a much better name. It's hard to overestimate the value of good names. You know you are working. Ah, ah. I asked a whole bunch of people when I wrote the book Clean Code. I asked a whole bunch of people, what is clean code? What, what does it mean to you? One of the people I asked was Ward Cunningham. And Ward Cunningham came back to me and he said, you know you are working on clean code when each routine, you know how old Ward is when you see words like routine, uh, when each routine turns out to be pretty much what you expected. At first, I was let down by that statement. I thought, well, okay, 
doesn't really tell me much. And then I thought about it for a minute. When is the last time you saw a function that was pretty much what you expected? Most of the time, you look at a function, and you're going, what? What? There's a principle of design reviews, uh, which is that the metric for design reviews is WTFs per minute. Huh? What? What? If you've got a lot of those per minute, something's wrong with that code. When is the last time you looked at a function and you went, yeah, mm -hmm, yep, yeah, that's right, yep, okay, next function. Ooh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much what you expected. In some sense, we would like our code to be boring. Instead of filling us with tension, wondering what the hell this thing does, we can look at our code and go, yep, 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 that's right, yes, yeah, ah, yeah, I understand that. That's the way we would like our code to read. Pretty much what we expect. No surprises. And half the battle to achieving that is simply choosing good names for small functions that do one thing. The smaller and more focused a function is, the easier it is to choose a descriptive name. This is a fundamental truth. If you can name a function, you know what it does. If you find trouble naming a function or a class, you don't know what it does. That's simple truth. And so we try to find names for our functions and our classes. And when we can't, or when we're never satisfied with those names, it's time to refactor because something's wrong with our concepts. We want to maybe split things apart a different way until we can name them until the name suddenly makes sense. Choosing good names has an impact on our designs. If you can't choose a descriptive name, your function is probably too big and probably does more than one thing. Don't be afraid to make a name long. Uh, there was a time when compilers had a limit. Uh, some Fortran people might remember six letter constra constraint. Uh, I used to work on an assembler that had a four-letter constraint. It's tough to get meaningful names in four letters. But nowadays, no limit. No limit uh, except screen width. I don't want you to blow the width of the screen with your names. So you should probably have a 20 or 25 or 30 character limit of some kind. But that's plenty of space to make your names as readable as possible. Now, I do not want all of your names to be long. I don't want you know, every name in your system to read like a sentence, but some of them should. Right? A, a long descriptive name is better than a short enigmatic name with a long descriptive comment. Who's seen these? Functions that have a strange name, and then there's a comment that explains what they do. What the hell is that comment there for? Put the comment in the name. Right? If you can state what the function does in one sentence, then the name of the function ought to be that sentence. Using a naming convention, use a naming convention that allows multiple words to be easily read, like camel, case, or underscores. Doesn't matter to me which of these you use. Uh, it seems to me that the .NET world is perfectly happy with camel case. That's fine. The Ruby community seems to like underscores. Fine. Don't care. Just use it consistently. And make use of those multiple words to give the function's a name that says what it does. This takes time. And don't be afraid of spending time on this. Programmers get into this funny situation where they feel, I've got to get this done. I've got to get this done. OK, name, blah. OK, next. Uh, foo. <laughs> OK, if foo, then bar. OK, it works. Great, next problem. I don't mind if you use a name like foo early. You know, if you're sitting there going, okay, if, foo, whatever, and then you come back to it and say, okay, what did I mean by foo? What? Oh, change the name. I don't mind if you choose very pragmatic names at first, but an hour later, I expect them all to be gone. An hour later, I expect you to have gone through that code and cleaned it up. I want you to look at the code you just got working. Every 10 minutes, look at the code that you just got working and ask yourself, OK, now I got it working. And in order to get it working, I had to focus on getting it working. But now I want to focus on cleaning it up. So I'm going to change these names. I'm going to break this function apart. 
I want you to constantly, every few minutes, sweep through the code you are working and make little improvements to it. Never let those pragmatic decisions you make when you're trying to get the code working accumulate to make a mess. Go back and clean. How do, um, how do restaurant chefs cook hundreds and hundreds of meals a night? Do you believe that they just cook, 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 use utensils, cook, 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 when, and all the dirty utensils can have, get thrown into piles and they keep on grabbing clean ones, cook, 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 and then at the end of the night they've got these mounds of messy utensils that they clean? That is not the way they work. Chefs who work quickly clean as they are going. Okay, they use a knife, they cut something, they clean the knife. They do something else, they clean the spoon. They clean their work area constantly. Look at a good sushi chef. Who, who, who eats sushi? Watch a sushi chef work, a really good one. And his motions are all very controlled. He never rushes. He knows exactly what he's doing at any given point. He's serving a dozen people, doesn't matter. And he's cleaning his utensils all in the same motions. You'll watch him cut, 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 clean, slice, pick something up, cut, 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 clean. He's got the motions down. He is practiced to the point where the cleaning is simply part of the preparation. That's what we need to be doing as well. You should try several different names and read the code with each in place. And our modern IDEs make this very, very simple. And you just change the names anytime you want, read it through, go, eh, don't like that one, let's try this one, let's try that one, so that you can see and clean your code effectively. Choosing descriptive names will clarify the design of a module in your mind and help you improve that module. You may finally stumble on a name that has meaning and realize that, that the function doesn't do what the name says it does, and yet the name is right, and the function is wrong, and so you split the function apart. That happens all the time. So the act of choosing names will help you to partition your design better. And of course, your names should be consistent. Uh, you can see these are fairly consistent names. They use the same kind of prefixes. So the names set up a pattern that is predictable. If there were a new kind of page to include, you'd know what the name of that function was. So uh, consistency is a big help as well. The similarity of those names makes it possible to predict what the other names would be. How many arguments should a function have? That's usually the way it is when I ask a question. Usually the answer is on the screen. No more than three. The best possible number of arguments for a function to have is none. Right? It takes no understanding to understand a function that has no arguments. You don't have to spend any time on the arguments at all. The next best is one, followed by two. Three starts to get a little hard. And then four is, is uh, I just don't do four. Unless I've got a real good excuse, I won't do four arguments in a function. How many of you have seen functions that have 12 arguments? Right? And what the hell? Why, 12 arguments, and then some of them are Booleans. Yeah. Uh, Bob, 1920, true, true, false. What? What are those? What, which order are they in? Has anybody stared and stared and stared at one of those only to realize that one of those two booleans was swapped? Right? Ah! The ideal number of arguments is zero. That's a nil attic function. Next comes one, followed by two. Three arguments should be avoided where possible, although I will allow three arguments. Four is just plain wrong. And OK, there are times when I will do four if I'm really pushed, but I will work hard to try and get those four things out of there. I'll try and hard to turn it into something less than four, because there's just something wrong with having too many arguments. The fact that we can pass arguments does not mean that we should. Most of the time, we don't want to be passing arguments. How can you avoid passing arguments? You've got two functions. They're in the same class. How can you avoid passing an argument? Take the thing that, you're, that you'd like to pass and turn it into a field of the class. Then you don't have to pass it. Ooh, if I do that, 
then I'm perverting the class. I'm adding a variable to the class. I shouldn't do that. Wait a minute. If you've got a bunch of functions that are sharing data and you're passing them around, the data they're sharing probably belong in yet another class. It is very likely that those functions ought to be methods on a completely different class where the things you're passing as arguments ought to be fields. If you are passing lots of arguments to functions, almost certainly you have not partitioned it into classes properly. If you pass, if you have functions that take four or five arguments, those four or five arguments are cohesive. They're passed into a function. They belong together. And objects, uh, variables that are cohesive ought to be in a class. So if you've got lots and lots of arguments, you're probably missing a class somewhere. Uh, what about constructors? Constructors often have lots and lots of arguments in them. Too bad. Don't do that. Instead, have a default constructor and use set functions. I don't want to see 17 arguments in a row. No one can remember the orders of them. So let's have some set functions that have nice names. Then you can say set address, set name, set phone number, set whatever, so that you know the names of them. Arguments are hard. They take conceptual power. They, ca they take conceptual power in a number of different realms. There's the syntax of the arguments that's a problem. In our case, the order of them. So we have to not only remember what the arguments are, we have to remember what the order is. If we, uh, if we use set functions, we can at least avoid the order problem. Consider, for example, the string buffer that we had in the original code. And when I extracted it, I was passing that string buffer around. I passed that string buffer to all the functions in that, in that first refactoring. I eventually got rid of that by promoting that string buffer to a field. And that, that ended that problem. When you are reading the story told by a module, include setup page is easier to understand than include setup page into some string buffer. It's easier to understand that than it is to understand that. Why? Because as you're reading this one, you have to stop here and consider, well, what is that? What I oh, yeah, that's a string buffer. It causes you to do a momentary pause as you're reading that code. And you go, oh, oh yeah, I understand it. And that momentary pause is the killer, because we're doing that all over the place. Every time we do that momentary pause, we are pushing the stack in our mind. We are saying, OK, wait a minute. Forget about what we were just thinking about. Focus on that detail. Oh, yes, I understand the detail. Pop the stack. And the human stack is faulty. We lose elements out of it all the time. You push six elements, you're not going to get all six of them back. Right? So it's always wise to avoid making humans push the stack in their mind. Instead, do this, not that. The argument is at a different level of abstraction. What is this argument? It's a string buffer. What's the string buffer doing getting passed into something at as high level as that? It's a shift in abstraction layer. It forces you to know a detail that isn't really very important at this point. So get it out of there. Output arguments. Output arguments are the devil's spawn. You have a, a when you look at a function, and you see a couple of things being passed into that function, your mind is set on the fact that they're going into the function. And yet, sometimes we will pass in references that we expect to be loaded with stuff. They become output variables. And this is hideous. Hideous. Because you, you're, you're reading it, and you think that data is going in. How many of you have gone back over and over this function only to finally realize 10 minutes later, oh, it's an output? Don't do that to people. Pass things in, take your return values as outs, or put your outs into fields. Don't pass in output variables. They're hideous. We don't usually expect data to be coming out into an argument. <clears throat> there are two common reasons to pass a single argument into a function. You may be asking a question about that argument, like this one. 
if the file exists, my file, or you may be operating on that argument, like transforming it into something else. Those two uses are what people expect. Either you're doing a query or you're doing a state transformation. That's what people expect. They don't expect anything else. You should choose names that make this distinction very clear. Either it is a query or it is a command. You don't want to confuse people about that. And please do not pass in flag arguments. When you see a bool argument, you know that function does more than one thing, by definition. If there's a bool in the argument, there's an if statement in the function. And the function is doing one thing if it's true and another thing if it's false. You shouldn't have boo Boolean arguments going into your functions at all, if you can avoid it. And you certainly don't want to have more than one Boolean argument going into your function. Two argument functions. <coughs> It is easier to understand right field name than it is to understand right field output stream name. This is a cognitive break. It forces you to push the stack. You know, wait a minute, what? Oh, yes, okay, an output stream. I'm pushing the name, writing the name to the output stream. I would rather read this. The first one glides past the eye. The second one requires the short pause, the cognitive break. Avoid that. We should never ignore any part of the code. The parts we ignore are where the bugs will hide. What happens when you read this? You start skipping that. As you see more and more statements like this, and you know that the first argument is the output stream, you just start skipping it. How many of you have done this before? You've got a bunch of functions that you're reading, and you know what the first couple of arguments are, so you just skip over them, because you know the interesting one is the third argument. Right? So, and then you, the bug you're looking for is actually in one of the first two. When you write code that people will take permission to ignore, they will ignore it. And I'll skip the triads for the moment because I want to get to side effects. Side effects. Who's uh, been studying functional programming lately? Very, uh, very popular nowadays. Languages like Haskell and F-sharp and Scala and so on all these neat functional languages. These are languages without side effects, or they're supposed to be, of course. Uh, most of them are hybrid so that they allow side effects anyway. A, lang a side effect is when a function changes the state of something in a hidden way. It does one thing that it's supposed to do, but then it also does this other sneaky thing which changes someone's state. And that's very confusing. You'd like to avoid that. Uh, your function promises to do one thing, but it also does other hidden things to the variables of its own class. These are devious and damaging mistruths that result in strange temporal couplings. What's a temporal coupling? A temporal coupling is a coupling of order. One function must be called before another. We, uh, we see these very commonly, things like open and close. You have to call open before you can call close. And everybody understands that, temporal coupling. But I just got done dealing with a problem in the, in the speaker's lounge where I had two, func two statements. And if they occurred in one order, the system worked. If they occurred in another order, the system crashed. And the two statements had no logical connection with each other. And I, why does it crash if it's this way? Why does it work if it's that way? And I spent a couple of hours trying to figure out why inverting those two caused a crash. And I traced it way the heck down to some horrible concurrency problem interacting with JUnit. That's that thing that I was debugging in the speaker's line. Some horrible concurrency thing with JUnit. A temporal coupling, something that forces you to call functions in a certain order. That's a side effect. Side effects call temporal couplings. And we would like to eliminate them. <coughs> There is a temporal coupling or a side effect in this code. Can you find it? Ah, there it is. We are um, <coughs> checking the guy's password to see if he entered his password properly. And as we get in there, we initialize the session. Now, Maybe this makes sense. You know, the guy's logging in. We ought to initialize his session. But we're making the assumption 
that the only time that this function will ever be called is when we're logging in. We're also making the assumption that it won't be called more than once. If someone calls this twice in the process of logging in, we're going to initialize the session twice. These are uh, side effects, temporal couplings, things that cause problems in the ordering of our functions. We would like to not do that. Uh, are there any questions? I'm going to abort the talk at this point. I could keep on going for yet another half hour. But are there any questions before we close? Yes. Small thing. I have not said anything about the use of flags. They're evil. Don't use flags, for goodness sake. Don't pass them in as arguments. Don't have Boolean flags. Uh, or if you do, make sure that their scope is very limited. Uh, are global variables evil? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes global variables are evil, uh, especially global variables that are set. But even some global variables aren't really evil. Sometimes global variables are appropriate. I just don't want very many of them. The more local a variable is, the more I'm willing to tolerate it. So we have variables inside a class. Think about the instance variables inside a class. For, for all intents and purposes, the functions of that class believe those variables to be global. As far as the methods of the class are concerned, they are global. Right? So we don't mind global variables as long as their scope is constrained. Some variables you can have out at the global scope, but not too many, please. You don't want a lot of them out there. Uh, is it true that languages like C Sharp and Java don't allow you to have global variables? No, you can have global variables. Right? You can have a class named global and put a bunch of static variables in it. Those are global variables. Right? So uh, you can have as many global variables as you want in all of our modern languages. Uh, just try not to do them very much. Flags, flags that are passed around from function to function. Flags that remember how a function was called the, pr the last time it was called. Those are things that we should avoid. They're side effects. If you remember how the function was called the last time it was called, that's a side effect. Because your intent is to change the way the function behaves the next time it is called. Does any rem anybody remember the Sturtoke function of the standard library in C? Right. Deep side effects inside that, inside that function. You called it with one argument, and then you called it with another argument. If you called it with a zero, it initialized it. If you called it with other things, it kept state around. Terrible, terrible. Very difficult to use. Uh, concurrency problems up, up to craziness. Any other questions? Yes. So the question was, why did I have one function that said include setups and teardowns? Why didn't I have two functions, one that said include setup and the other that said include teardown? Is it the goal to have as few functions as possible? And the answer to that is yes, that is the goal. To have as not as few functions as, as possible, but within a function to call as few functions as possible. If I could say, include setup and then follow that immediately by include teardown, I would just extract that into another function called include setups and teardowns. And it would just call those two functions. So that it's very clear to the, to the reader exactly what's going on. Yep, anybody else? Way up there. I'll use my laser, but I'd blind you. Yes. Yes. So the, the question is, I, I said that I preferred set functions to constructors. Uh, I don't want all the arguments in the constructor. I want a bunch of set functions. And then what about inconsistent state? Are you writing tests? Right. If you are writing tests, you will not have inconsistent state. If you are not writing tests, then I, then I understand your fear. But if you, if you are following the rules of test-driven development, 
there is no way you can get inconsistent state uh, by using set functions. Now, you may think, well, yes, but what about defensive programming? Your tests are your defense. It is a shame in some ways that we are using the compiler to defend against bad programming styles of other people. Our tests are our defense. We will make sure our software works by testing it, not just by constraining the way people can call it by using strong typing. Many people think that strong static typing is a barrier to bugs. It's not much, actually. Uh, and that's been proven a number of times. We get a lot of comfort out of that strong static typing. But note that in every one of the modern languages today, there is a way to circumvent that strong static typing easily so that you really get, are getting no protection out of it at all. Anything else? I can barely see her. Is somebody up there? Oh, yeah, way up there. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is a very good question. I have a class. That class has a number of public functions. Those public functions get extracted out into several private functions. Those private functions get extracted out into even lower level private functions. Do I test at all levels? Answer, no. The tests I write go against the public functions, not against any of the other functions. Those functions are there for explanatory purposes. They're not to be used by other people to be called. And so it's not necessary to test them independently. If I were to look at the, at the test coverage, I would find that they were 100% covered by the tests that call the public functions. And if they're not, something is very wrong. No one should be calling those functions, those private functions, except the public ones. And if my public tests don't cover the private functions, something is deeply wrong somewhere. So answer, no. I, I test only at the public function level. All right, that covers it. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.